I call the Monday, April 8th, 2024 meeting into order. Could we all please stand for the pledge to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can't hear you. What was that? Don't speak too loud. You're just mouthing it. You're not even saying it. Welcome to everyone. Mr. Block, it's nice to see you. Um, I just like to remind our board members and viewing guests that um, we are conducting this public meeting um, in person and streaming it live stream from the LGI at Cedar Crest High School. And the link to view the live stream, live stream meeting is located on um, school board meetings page of the Cornwall Lebanon School District website. Being that this is a work session, I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Demensic. Thank you, Mr. Schlegel. And once again, welcome to everyone who is here and viewing our April public board work session. Uh, I do have some uh, updates to share before I do that. As this is our public work session, the administration will be presenting items to the Board of School Directors for discussion, review, and consideration. Many of the items that we are presenting will be on the agenda for next week uh, for approval. Uh, that is how we typically run our meetings. Uh, so during that time, if there are questions, certainly board directors, we will entertain them. If there are any questions from any guests in attendance, uh, we ask that you please <clears throat> wait until the conclusion of the meeting and we will have an opportunity to entertain those questions. So just a couple of updates that I do have. We are now into the fourth marking period as of Thursday, April 4th. Uh, so we will have report cards available for parents to be viewing uh, next Thursday, or this Thursday, April 11th. Today, actually, we were not in session for students as today was a professional learning day for our staff. Uh, we do have activities, of course, that are taking place in and around the campus. We did send out notification to families <clears throat> about the, uh, the solar eclipse event, uh, just about cautions as well as resources for families to consider uh, for today. Of course, all of our spring sports are up and running. And our spring concert season, now that we have concluded our, our musicals, will be beginning uh, with the high school chorus concert on April 14th. Some of the things that we will be talking about tonight at our meeting include the campus construction, which we will discuss. Uh, we will have our annual approval of our 24-25 auxiliary organizations, uh, items, business items such as our health care fund operating statement and our general fund budget timeline. We'll also be talking about some of our contracts for uh, virtual resources and educational resources, as well as uh, our contracts for transportation this evening. And our next meeting will be next Monday here in the LGI, beginning at 530. So those are just some of the general <clears throat> updates that I have. And with that, we will move into the items that we have on the agenda this evening to present. And we'll start with buildings and grounds. Okay, um, just to give you an update on a Falcon connector, um, as you probably noticed, um, they did do some digging over here off of Lincoln um, to connect the sewer pipe. Um, so that part is finished. Um, we also have the clearing of the lot. Um, so I will be sharing some pictures to help you understand a little bit about what's going on. Um, for the uh, next week's voting meeting, uh, we are looking at having two change orders approved. They are both credits, so I welcome those. Um, the one is for the electrician, uh, the electrical contractor for $7,400 credit. Um, and that is just to change some of the designs, um, patch cable credit for data phone switch switches. Um, also a credit for our plumbing contractor, um, $9,318. Um, and that is for a redesign of an area underneath one of the stairs in the Falcon connector, um, just simplifying that area so we have less uh, material and piping to pay for, as well as labor. But um, if uh, Dr. Murray wants to go through the pictures, um, these are just some of the areas that I thought maybe I could share. Um, that's behind the stadium, working on a piece of the sewer line. 
Um, and then this is a parking lot that we put in the back of the middle school to be able to accommodate the staff parking um, since the area where they normally park have trailers. And then this is uh, Monticello, I believe, and Lincoln, where they brought the pipe across. Don't believe so. That is our general. No, that was contractor. the general contractor. Yeah. Yeah. So there are more pictures online. We do have a web page dedicated to um, communicating what's going on with the construction. So if you want to hop on there at some point, you can see even more pictures um, that were uploaded there. But again, next week we're looking at um, up getting approved those two change orders. And again, they are both credits. Um, so that is an update for the Falcon Connector. I do have one piece, um, just renovations in general. We did talk about um, material remover, removal for the high school and a potential grant for that. And what I'd like to have done next week is your approval of a resolution to give me authorization to uh, submit on behalf of the district uh, for that grant. So those are some of the motions that we have on relative to the Falcon connector. Okay, the next item is um, two of our summer projects. That there are two items there: um, the re-roofing project and also the paving project. Um, both of those bids were open today, so um, we were kind of scrambling to try to get some of that information together for you. The first one I wanted to talk about is the partial re-roofing project. Um, that was to be for the Cedar Crest High School a piece there, a middle school as well as Cornwall Elementary, and the, high, um, the stadium press box. Um, bid opening, uh, the advertisement actually took place in March, and um, we actually extended the bid to today. Um, it was supposed to be on Thursday, but it was in our best interest to extend it to today. We did have five vendors participate. Um, the low bid uh, did come in a little above budget by 187. So we are going to look to see what our options are this week and prioritize because, again, as I mentioned, there are multiple buildings here um, and see what we can do, especially with the high school coming up on renovations. Is it something that we absolutely need? So we're going to take a look at that this week and then uh, make a recommendation for you to approve next week. Yes, he did come in low, um, but it was still over budget. So we're gonna look, kind of look at that and work with him. Um, paving project, paving project was done online. Um, the, the bid opening was done online. Um, we did advertise in March as well for that project. Um, and we had two vendors participate. Steckbeck was, is our civil engineer for this, and they put together um, the, the results, um, which I do have in board docs for you. Um, however, we had done a lot of alternates for this project, so we had choices to, uh, based on the results. So we'd like to take this week to look at those numbers and see what we wanna do with those. The base bid did come under budget, um, but some of the alternates we might be able to um, take care of without going over budget too much. So we're gonna look at that this week and then uh, approve a contractor next week uh, based on those alternates would determine which vendor we would go with. Ebenezer Elementary School, I did talk about um, replacing the chiller out there due to its age. Um, we have to expedite this process a little, uh, like move it up. I talked about going out to bid in the fall, but we probably ought to go out to bid now for that um, because the equipment, there's a lead time of 50 weeks. So that's almost a year. So we wanna make sure that we have that in place, um, at least ordered um, if something would happen to that equipment. Um, so we're gonna look at advertising in May um, schedule the bid opening at the end of May and then award um, a contract in June for that. Um, the estimated cost is $750,000. Um, it is going to be funded by the Capital Reserve Fund. Um, and we're looking right now just to authorize the district office to be able to advertise. The bid. 
And then um, our annual approval right now with the chiller maintenance. Um, this chiller maintenance is expired. The current one is expiring at the end of June, and we're looking at renewing Ainsworth again for one year. Um, that's to cover five of our six buildings. Union Canal is new. We, um, we're, we're okay with not covering that at this point. Um, and that total cost is $22,077. And we're looking at getting your approval next week for that. I believe that's all the items we have for buildings and grounds. <clears throat> um, some big items obviously in there, ones that we have discussed before, particularly the roofs, the chillers, uh, the, uh, uh, the, un the unit at Ebenezer, and then the paving projects as well. Are there any questions about any of those items? Yeah, did you say 50 weeks lead time? Yes. Not quite a year. <laughs> and that's why we're not going to wait until the fall to go out the bid. We're going to try to get that underway now so we can at least have it ordered if something would happen. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll move on to community relations, curriculum, and staff development. And I believe, Dr. Rackley, you have the first item on this okay. section. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have two items this evening. The first one I want to update you on curriculum approvals. Um, if you remember last year, we spent April, May, and June um, plowing through lots of curriculum last year for your approval. And we were able to do two years' worth of our curriculum cycle last year as we transitioned from um, kind of our old cycle to our new cycle. And so last year was a really busy spring for sure. This spring is the spring uh, is a little softer, I promise. It's a little softer and gentler, but, but still a lot. And so I just wanted to give you a, a quick update on where we were. So we have three departments writing curriculum this year. That would be the business department, which is grades 9 through 12. Um, through some really exciting situations and enrollments, um, we're able to add some additional courses from our EPG to our curriculum. And so we're working on finishing up those business courses right now. Our library curriculum is the second curriculum that we're working on. That is grades K through 12, remembering that in the elementary school they meet on a regular basis. Um, the secondary library curriculum is much more research-based, how to use the resources that we have available to them, um, digital citizenship. And then um, our science curriculum, if you remember, we talked about the brand new STEEL standards, um, science, technology, engineering, um, environmental literacy, um, and sustainability standards, and we're really excited um, with the work that our curriculum leaders in all three departments, but our science department especially, has really taken a big lift and worked really hard to align this new curriculum to the STEEL standards. It is a significant change um, in how we teach science, but we're really excited to move forward with um, the efforts that our teachers, grades K through 12, have put into writing this curriculum for you. And so we're very excited to have those coming up for you in May and June. Um, the second item that I have for you this evening is to talk about Falcon Flex. If you remember, Falcon Flex is our professional learning model that we use here that allows teachers to select their professional learning sessions to meet their individual professional development needs, as well as experience agency through what we call a professional development catalog, um, basically, which exists in Falcon World. So our call to presenters is currently open um, and will close on April the 22nd, at which point we'll go through and start approving courses. Um, our catalog will open for teachers beginning on May 1st, where they can begin selecting their courses for their professional learning time. And then um, our courses begin on Monday following the last day of school, which would be June the 10th. Just some important notes. We talked about this last year, but just as a review, um, to be eligible to be a Falcon Flex session, there are five strands or themes that all of our courses have to fit into. Um, instructional strategies, curriculum, assessment, technology integration or professional practice. Those all align with our district initiatives and how we really want to focus our um, efforts in our professional development time. And then the other piece are those Falcon Flex summits, so almost like mini conference days, um, one in June and then one the end of July, beginning of August, where we have not only presenters from the district, but presenters from the community, from the IU. We have vendors coming to help us make sure we're using products correctly. And so we're really excited to look at those on June 10, 11, and 12 and then July 30th, 31st, and August 1st coming up this summer. That's all I have today. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rackley. Any questions about any of those items? 
More to come on that, particularly in the areas of the curriculum approvals. That will be starting up in May. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes. All right. Dr. Bosman, go. Question. Yes. Is that uh, trade time in the summer, the 10th, the 11th, or July 30th, 31st? Yep. So teachers can choose up to half of their professional learning time through Falcon Flex. So for our secondary folks, that's 13 and a half of their 26 or 27 hours. And then for elementary, it's 10 of their hours can be chosen through Falcon Flex. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, this is something that's worked quite well as we can try to individually tailor what works best for all the different groups. It's been, been very successful. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Bosman, do you have the next item? Okay, good evening. Uh, this next item is Ed Options, and we go back to, <coughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Schaefer's presentation previously about the different options that we offer. Ed Options happens to be one of those uh, platforms that we utilize as part of our C3 program. So um, in Board Docs is the contract for 2425 for you to review. Just to give you an idea, now some of these numbers are rough estimates, but to give you an idea that that contract covers roughly about 15 elementary students and 35 secondary education students. Um, this provides live lessons, recorded sessions, and other resource options for students. Now, to give you uh, an idea, just uh, last year at the same time, we approved at options for about 215000 So while at the surface it looks like it's a savings, but it's really that funding transitioning more over to the LLVS uh, side of the programming, and that's mainly because uh, the ed options, which is semesterized, doesn't line up as easily as the LLVS, which is more by marking period. So it's more a shift of the funding from ed options over to LLVS in terms of on the budgeting side. So we'll be looking for approval for that next week. Okay. Questions on that item? I know we had a very lengthy discussion about, about virtual learning uh, last month, so we did talk a lot about that. So. And it was very informative, too. Yes. All right. <clears throat> we'll move on, then, to extracurricular items. We just have one overnight field trip request, and that's for the FFA um, to go to the state competition at Penn State University State College. And that is going to be on June 11th to the 13th. It's the only one I have right now to get approved next week. The next item is our list of auxiliary organizations we get approved annually. Um, these organizations have guidelines that they have to abide by um, in order to be on our insurance for liability purposes. So we do cover these organizations for liability. And we'll ask for your approval next week for those. This is also an annual approval. We uh, review the compensation schedules for athletic event workers and aquatics positions so we can have um, workers to be able to help us with ticket taking and announcing um, as well as lifeguards and supervisors for the lifeguards. Um, and I, it's about an average of three and a half to three and three quarters percent increase for these position rates. We'll ask for your approval next week on those. Okay, all of those items under extracurricular are ones that we have approved previously. Those are annual renewals. So any questions about any of those items? Okay. Uh, we'll go next to finance and business. Okay, the first item I have is um, a piece of the uh, Lancaster Lebanon IU 13 budget that we need to approve. Um, all the school districts have to approve these pieces. It's a general operating budget. 
Um, it takes 1.6% uh, of the IU's expenditures two pieces that need to be approved is the core program services as well as the instructional media services. Um, core program of services looks like it's increasing by 2.2%. Instructional media services by 1.95%. Um, the district contribution will be increasing by about 2% and we'll be looking for your approval next week. I do have um, highlights that they provide. Um, to understand more about what is included in the general operating budget, the core programming, and then also the instructional media services, so those, those two pieces. And then just as a follow-up, all of the subsequent uh, approvals will be coming in May or June for the major programs. Next item is an update on where we are with our health care fund. Um, this is a, about a $12 million employee benefit program. Um, we are self-funded. Um, last year we had experienced a negative variance of uh, $1.1 million. Um, there's a chart kind of showing you what our um, results have been over the last several years. Um, current status, um, we're showing a loss of 100 or a a variance of 100,000, and this is cash basis, so it's very hard to estimate where we're coming in at because it's based on when the claims are submitted by the providers. Um, but impacts is ma mainly your high claimants, um, but also just healthcare costs in general. Um, my guess is that we are looking at maybe a, a half a million negative variants by the end, and that goes over the summer as invoices are coming in, we back that into this fiscal year since it was incurred at that point. Again, this, is a, <clears throat> this has been a challenge, obviously, which is the increased cost in healthcare expenses. And this continues to grow outside, uh, just exponentially, in terms of what this is far exceeding the inflation of other items that we would have within our budget, and I think that's the case pretty much everywhere, but we're impacted by this as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have a question. Do the bills just come to us and then we pay them, or does it go through like a provider that potentially negotiates the bills and then, like what do we do? Yes. The only reason I ask that is because every company that pays medical bills is dealing with this right now. Um, and last year, Allstate actually saved $3.5 million simply because they had a provider negotiate them for them. Um, so that might be something to consider. Well, these are negotiated rates. <clears throat> so we use what's called, I, I don't know if that was in here earlier, but it's called a TPA, third party administrator. It's coming up. Yeah, oh, you're getting to that part. So, so we do do that. We do have a company that does that. Yeah. And we also have um, Assured Partners is our healthcare consultant, and they're a huge part of the negotiation of of the, um, just the uh, provider's negotiation, like agreeing to the prices. So they go through a process every year. For the billing purpose of, of this, <clears throat> on the calendar, I guess we're, we do this on the fiscal year being June 31st, July 1st. Mm -hmm. We back pay bills that come in like June 30th and you probably don't review them until August 1st or something like that. That doesn't, that, that affects back the, the previous budget, not the new budget. Correct. Yes, accounting wise, we have to back in anything up until 60 days after the close of the fiscal year. Okay. If we are aware that it is um, for the previous fiscal year, we have to back that in. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other anything questions else? on this on this part of it right here? Okay, our next item is um, just, uh, to just go over the employee benefit renewals. Um, the first one is our medical insurance. Again, the, the, the district is self-funded. Um, Highmark is our third party a TPA. Um, the rates based on actuarial results from the weighted blend of um, three cal calendar years, they look over the experience and the situations um, and then they Assured partners assist on with the actuarial to provide us with recommended rates. We are looking north of 10% for this 
upcoming fiscal year. Um, and, the, and just so you know, the employees um, do contribute to that premium. And right now, there is a difference between 12% and 14%, depending on which the employee chooses of a plan. Um, hi, Mark. Right now, we're in the middle of a three-year agreement um, and year one of the current agreement. So there really is nothing next week for you to approve with um, the medical insurance. For dental insurance, um, we have United Concordia. We do an annual renewal on that, and we're looking at a premium increase of 8%. Um, so we'll be asking for your approval next week on the annual renewal for that piece. For the vision insurance, uh, we use national vision administrators um, who it goes through the Pennsylvania State Education Association. Um, it is a two-year contract renewal and no change in the premium this coming renewal. So we'll ask for your approval on, on that. And then the last piece is our learn long-term disability and life insurance. We use the same provider for these two benefits. Um, it is CM Regent Insurance, a two-year agreement approved um, back in the April of 2023, so we don't, do not need any type of approval next week for that one. We'll be in year two of that agreement. Any questions about any of the employee benefit programs and the health care? before Mrs. Hens goes on to the next item. Okay. Okay. All right, I just wanna kind of remind you of where we are with budget. I haven't spoke about that the last um, <laughs> two months. Um, we are working in the background um, and getting that prepared for you. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, um, even as we look for our timeline, you know, we're not sure where we are with the state subsidies, federal subsidies for any of the programs we usually receive at the end of, in the middle of May, maybe the end of May. Um, finalizing next um, year's special education placements, um, and then also when the state will be passing their budget, what's their timeline? We, we, we usually don't know that by the time that we're approving a, a final budget. Um, but that said, if we go to the next slide, just to understand um, what we're, we're doing here with the May, um, we will review at our work session um, our recommendations, and then we would ask for your approval in May as well. So the public work session in May is when we're looking at look, uh, details. And then also, um, after we get the proposed final approved, we have to lay out the proposed final on PDE's form publicly um, until the um, final budget is approved in June. Um, and during that time, once we approve the proposed final, we will be making tweaks to that until um, the public work session in June. And then in June is when we would approve any of the changes from our proposed final to our final, um, which would also set the tax rate. That's a standard timeline that we have for budget adoption, and those are timelines that are actually we must budget by June 30th, so those are some of the things that we have to do, and a proposed final budget does need to sit for a month now prior to approval. So we'll be working on that in the upcoming months, and we will have something ready to present at the May meeting. Correct. Okay. Any questions about any of those items? Okay. We'll go to personnel. Okay, for personnel, uh, right now for administrative positions, we are working through the process with filling the assistant middle school principal position. So uh, we'll see how that unfolds for a timeline for approval, uh, whether that will happen this month or next. Uh, I'm going to go down here and read the items that are on the board agenda. Um, they're in board docs for you to review as well. So the first one is accept or ratify the following resignations and retirements. Amanda Carpenter, Payroll Specialist, Educational Service Center, effective March 18, 2024, due to resignation. 
Daniel Yingst, electrician, effective March 26, 2024, due to resignation. Brandy Trumbo, building assistant, 6.75 hours, Cedar Crest Middle School, effective April 5th, 2024, due to resignation. Vicki Kantz, District Office Receptionist, Educational Service Center, effective June 7th, 2024, due to retirement. Terry Light, Principal Secretary, Cedar Crest High School, effective July 31st, 2024, due to retirement. Those designated above with an asterisk will continue employment with the Cornwall Lebanon School District. Approve the following requests for leave. Joanna Gettle, second grade instructor, Cornwall Elementary School, childbearing leave effective approximately August 1st, 2024. Approve ratify the employment of the following personnel effective with the 2023-2024 school year pending completion of pre-employment materials. Gina Saracini, short-term substitute, kindergarten instructor, Cornwall Elementary School, at a per diem of $297.50, effective March 13, 2024. John Tintera, short-term substitute, social studies instructor, Cedar Crest High School, at a per diem rate of $297.50, effective April 9, 2024. Krista Benway, short-term substitute, autistic support instructor, Cornwall Elementary School at a per diem of $297.50, effective April 9, 2024. Olivia Cascarino, short-term substitute, kindergarten instructor, Cornwall Elementary School at a per diem of $155. Dawn Vanderhoff, payroll specialist, educational service center at an hourly wage of $22.76. Lisa Coomer, Personal care assistant, 6.5 hours, Cedar Crest High School, at an hourly wage of $15.90, effective April 2nd, 2024. Joshua Trovinger, seasonal groundskeeper, at an hourly wage of $15.50. Jennifer Young and Michael Garrett, summer maintenance crew worker, at an hourly wage of $14.50. Approve the employment of the following personnel effective with the 2024-2025 school year, pending completion of pre-employment materials. Hannah Neff, learning support instructor, Cornwall Elementary School, at a salary of 58,780. Jonathan Padilla Diaz, assistant football coach, Cedar Crest High School, at a salary of $4,750. Julia Bowersox, girls tennis, ten, tennis coach, Cedar Crest High School, at a salary of $4,608. Belinda Martinez, Magdalene Steller, Sam, Samantha Fink, Patricia Warnavage, and Matilda Reyes, English Language Development Camp instructors. Tammy Core, nurse, English Language Development Camp, at an hourly wage of $25.62 and Veronica Vasquez, Secretary, English Language Development Camp at an hourly wage of $16.50. And we would be seeking approval of these folks at next week's meeting. So it's a, not a heavy month for personnel <clears throat> this time of year, obviously, but we do have a few items that will be on the agenda. Any questions about any of those items? Yeah, um, related to personnel, what is the status right now of um, securing our substitute teachers? Uh, right now, I mean, we've, we have a, uh, for building substitute, or our building substitutes, we have at least one at each building. Um, that's been, we thought we were getting ahead of the curve. We actually had secured three extra folks, and that quickly one of them got a permanent job at Elko. Uh, one is filling in for Brenda Potter, who left at Cornwall to seek a job elsewhere. And so what we looked like we were three to the plus ended up being just one. Uh, since November, I don't remember the date, we've had maybe about five or six people apply for a substitute position. So it's been a little bit, 
you know, there, there haven't been a lot of those applications coming, but we are reaching out to folks, uh, folks from Millersville who we met, even our folks in ASOP, just to ask them what's their, you know, thoughts about remaining as a day-to-day -day sub, short-term substitute, building substitute, long-term, just to get a sense of what those folks are thinking. We sent them a survey recently just to get some of that info. So we know where they are in terms of their thoughts. So are we able um, daily to um, have the substitutes that we need when teachers are calling in? What we have utilized is not only the building subs, the folks that are filling, you know, going into ASOP and accepting jobs, and then we are utilizing some of our staff and paying them the supplemental uh, rate to also cover classes as well. And our, at the secondary, also utilizing our building assist, assistance as well. We've had to be creative about this. Yeah. Uh, there just are simply not teacher substitutes out there because of the nature of the position being part-time. Uh, you know, I can remember we had lists years ago of 35, 40 substitutes. Those days do not exist in any district. Uh, I do think that we're, we're ahead of the curve in this, but it's also, too, these times are particularly challenging. We do run into some shortages, and we have to be creative with how we utilize our staff and our buildings. I don't know what's going to change uh, with this in the future. I do know that we are uh, looking, we've continued to try to look at making our rates competitive. We've had some significant increases, and we're going to continue to have to re-examine that, that rate that we have for substitutes uh, to try to attract people into this. But even at that, there still has to be people that have either a teaching certificate or that have the emergency certification process that's through IU 13 that they have. So it's, uh, it's a challenge for every district. You know, I really applaud the efforts of our administration, everybody here, and working with our association to be creative. But it is an ongoing challenge. Um, have we thought about hiring permanent substitutes as part of our staff, you know, for every elementary school and in the middle school and in the high school? That's what Dr. Bosman, when we talk about building substitutes, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing already? Yeah. And so we're doing How many what, do we have? Uh, as many as we can find. So what happens is, though, is that in many cases when we have a short-term leave, those people might be the ones, like Dr. Bosman was talking about, well, this person goes here. So it's a very fluid thing. We started this year looking at this that we would hire, I think, eight. We've now expanded this just that we keep this posted and we'll hire people because we know that we're going to have a constant need for those positions. So that has helped us a lot. In fact, I think we were one of the first districts to do that back during COVID to just say we're going to hire, I think it was a dozen at the time, uh, building substitutes. So we've continued that practice as well. And we've given them a contract? No, these are not contracted. These are they're guaranteed work for every day. Have we thought about contracting people and having them as Great. permanent substitutes so that we have that, that, that we don't lose them to ELCA when they get a contract? We could and do that. And that way we're, we're a little bit more static and stable. Have we thought about that? We, I have thought about that. We've, look, we've looked at those considerations. Some of those would be very significant budgetary issues for 10 or 12 people. It would, it but would it stabilize the, um, the, you know, the influx of substitutes coming and going? Well, yes and no. So the challenge would be is that some days you have greater need than others. So it's, it's not that you would have then this group of people that there are many days where they would be utilized very well, but there would also be some days during the year where not so. So I'm not sure how that would work in terms of stabilizing that. It would be certainly a significant item that we'd have to look to because those would be permanent contracts that would then accrue each year. Uh, they would have a whole other benefits as well. Mm -hmm. So, so we are, we're looking at those types of options. What we have tried to do is to continually increase the uh, daily sub rate for those people that are committing to us on an everyday basis. I was just going to add to that. So for next year, our building substitutes, we're raising that to 175 per day. Um, and to just add to that, when we explored the idea of even offering the building substitutes benefits as maybe a way to attract folks, it really didn't net 
again, like maybe we were hoping would happen, that suddenly there would be an influx of people interested because benefits were offered. That was not the result. And most of our building subs, so right now I'm just, just trying to quickly count up. I think we have six currently right now uh, that are not in an assignment, like they've been placed in a short-term substitute role. So I think there are six right now that are actually working in that building substitute role like we intended it. Most of those do not have a teaching cert. Most of them have the IU guest teacher emergency cert. Um, so it's just something we continue to try different ideas in terms of trying to reach out to folks and hopefully garner some interest in these positions. The, the problem is, like we had said before, so many folks who didn't get jobs would go through and be your day-to-day -day subs, but they're getting jobs, so that pool of candidates just continues to shrink up. Why do you think they weren't, um, the, the um, offering of benefits wasn't, wasn't attracting and helping it stabilize that? Why, why do you think that was? It's an interesting question. You know, it's, I think it's just overall just there are less people that are certified and people that are looking at this as a temporary type of assignment or they had benefits elsewhere. So I think that's a challenge that is going to continue to exist. For Do you think salary years. played a role in that? Do you think hourly rate played a role in that? I think it's that? both, but I think salary because would have to be, I mean, when we, if we're talking about creating 10 to 12 or more permanent additional positions, that is a very, very sizable increase to our to overall budget uh, that would have to be accounted for. So what we're doing is we are increasing that daily rate, and that has helped because we still find that we have more building subs than other districts. But what's happening is, is that we're competing with that, with other districts. I don't know where all this ends with just the general lack of teacher candidates that we have or people going into education in the Commonwealth. But when we consider that, I know we had shared that in the last 10 to 12 years, we now have one third or less of the number of certified teachers that are coming from teacher ed programs across the Commonwealth. That's, a, that's an issue that is going to continue to be there. There are many districts across the Commonwealth that have struggled not just with filling substitutes, but filling teacher positions, period. Mm -hmm. They simply cannot fill permanent positions. So even if we had the permanent positions, you still have to have the people to fill them. So I think this is a, an issue that's going to be larger than us. It's going to take some some changes in order to fix this at the state level. How do we compare to Lancaster paying per, day, per diem for subs versus Dauphin County? How, how are we? We're the highest. We, what? We're the highest. We're higher than, yeah. than Lancaster? We are. Yeah. And still tr trouble. There are districts that we, we hear of many more concerns even from some of our neighbors within the, the Lancaster library. How do we utilize our building subs? And what I mean by that is, do we use them more in the long-term position, short-term? And if we use them in the short-term position, how do we know that we need, to new, need them? Because the teacher goes to ASAP tonight and says, I'm taking tomorrow off. Um, how do we know to fill that with the building sub rather than a regular sub? We have a whole process <laughs> that takes a lot of administrative time to make sure that we are utilizing people every day. But I can say, I think it's safe to say that uh, these people are not just having nothing to do on a given day. There's, there is always an assignment for them. But they are being utilized. It is, it is accounted for within our system, though. So, okay. so they have to be accredited to, accounted for. This is where you're going to be on that day. Yeah, we don't have people that are, that are not doing something. They're needed every day. They're not having to smoke by the copier or anything? No. No, they're busy. They're busy. There's a lot to do. Okay, so, yeah. thank you. And I, okay. but that's a good question, but we have a process where the principals work in the morning, and, and if, if I don't need the person in my building, then another person says, okay, boom, this is the building you go to. So there's that kind of process. A little bit different elementary to secondary because of start times and when those people are coming into work, but there's been a lot of cooperation and collaboration, collaboration amongst the principals and making sure that that we can maximize that. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there's, I, no, there's no dead time here. <laughs> I was just going to add that, so the plan coming into this school year was to have a total of nine building subs. It was 
four at the elementary, two at the middle school, three at the high school. And basically with the premise that these nine individuals show up every day to their assigned building, we've, oh, we've utilized ASOP and there's some settings in there where we've found ways to, rather than have our secretarial staff try and assign these folks before it gets filled by someone else, to utilize ASOP to have the building subs in there in a way that they're the first to get filled into it before it goes out and calls to minimize the chance that it's going to be filled by someone else and the building sub would somehow be not utilized to the, to the maximum extent. Um, so that's one, that's one piece to it. The other is, as Dr. Demensic was saying, the six building principles communicate and also share across levels because the system doesn't have that ability to see that there's an opening in another building that then can place the buildings up there. So there, there have been uh, uh, situations this year where we've actually moved some of our elementary building subs to the middle school. Um, not too often because there hasn't been that many times that they've been available and not already in a, an opening. Uh, but that is something we've tried to do that way as much as possible these nine folks are being utilized in an opening rather than maybe filling in somewhere else. So this is where this is where we have experienced some of what's happening across the state with the lack of certified candidates. But as I noted, I, when you read some of these headlines or you hear about some of these, you, you talk to people across the state, you realize how many permanent open unfilled positions there are, they're, they're not worried about, subs. they're worried about, do I have a permanent teacher for that classroom? This is, a, this is an issue that continues to, we have to continue to try to stay ahead of and make sure that we can have the people that we need to have here. Um, one of the things that I was wondering too is if we, um, we did bring on maybe even five permanent subs that we do offer contracts to. We, we, we could use that kind of as a feeder program then too when we do have openings. So it's kind of like a training, constantly keeping that, um, those extra people right here because teacher shortage is going to be an issue. So maybe we want to be a little more proactive. We want to think about possibly offering you know, contracts or talk about that and open that discussion up to the group um, so that we could have have this, this nice feeder. We have it for admin right now. We have an admin position that we're kind of using as a feeder then for our own admin staff. We could be thinking maybe a little more proactively, maybe thinking a little bit more progressively about how can we attract people, have them be sub permanent substitutes with contracts, and then we could use them then to fill some of our openings. But it might be nice to have those extra people it on It would hand. certainly help. There's no question about it. The question is, is what would the impact be on the overall budget mm -hmm. when we look at it? Because it's a matter of a, the number that we would need could be significant. Mm -hmm. In addition to some of the, uh, the additional resources that we're trying to put in place as well and supports across the district. So I think it's a great idea. I just the question would be is, is that how does that work within our budget? Sorry. I think we are heading into a teacher shortage and a teacher crisis. So I think we ought to think about lots of different ways of, of making, being proactive and, and attracting people. I think it, it's coming. That's certainly one of the things that we're going to have to look at. And I was just going to add, going to keep jumping in and adding to it, but um, I feel like this is the C3 discussion. Um, now, I would just add to that really thinking about it a lot once again the majority of our building substitutes have a bachelor's degree but are not certified so that's one piece to it in in the instance where the the one building sub left and got the job at elco probably the reality is if that person even if we had that person on a contract they're going to go elsewhere maybe we hold them the 60 days but they're going to take the, the the teaching position over a contracted building subposition, they're, they're going to go that route. Uh, you might be able to get them and hold them for 60 days. So um, while I'm open to all of those ideas, and I think all of us here want to try to be creative in, in what we can do to staff the buildings, I think unfortunately there's such, such a bigger um, 
dilemma that we're just, we've been just staying and treading, you know, staying above water, but it's getting harder and harder each year. So my question was, um, if, if budget wasn't an issue, how many full-time subs do you, I'm not saying that it is, but if we were able to be fully staffed with the subs that are full-time, how many do you think that we need? That's a great question. You know, <clears throat> I don't know that our number, you know, is it in the 12 to 15 range, perhaps, the, every single day. There are certain days where there's going to be heavier times than that. And so that's where you look at normally when you have people so. that were just day to day, you would call them and you would pay them for that day that they're working. But since there aren't as many people doing that because of just the overall general low unemployment that exists, that's what's making it challenging to do that. Yeah. So you're looking for people that are competing, you know, you're competing with people that say, well, I want something more permanent, I want something more steady. But that varies also throughout the year. There are times where it's lower and higher, so it ebbs and flows. All good ideas and good discussion, but it is, it is how all of these, you know, as we've talked about, personnel obviously is about 70% of our, of our entire budget. So we also, have to, how, does this, how does this work within there? And to Dr. Bosman's point, we still have to have people that are certified that are not necessarily just on that, that status, that we can do that. But that's much more complicated, particularly if it's a permanent position. So, I think we also just also have to remember that when our we don't have substitutes, that's a real burden on our teaching staff. Um, and we also have to remember that people at a record number are leaving the field um, as well. So we have to always kind of work around this. We have to really think about you know these creative ways of. Um, staffing and not putting a burden on our teaching staff as well I so I agree I think that's why we've tried to be creative with making sure that our rate is the highest within the IU uh, to try to make sure that we are getting people here as well as looking at the building subs that we hire you know we are constantly going to be in a process of adding those uh, we don't have a number to say well this is going to be X we're going to do what we need to do and we're going to certainly explore other ideas as well Okay. Any other discussion on that? I was just one more item with that. That was a closing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> if, if we need a timekeeper, I'm available. Uh, no. Uh, with uh, that last thing, you know, we've really tried to even be on the, I don't say the forefront, but in talking to candidates, sometimes we've been ahead of the curve a little bit, even in terms of utilizing the emergency permit, specifically the type 01 with the educational obligation, and really working through over the last probably maybe three or four years in getting some folks that had a bachelor's degree and work them through that certification process. And I know we've had candidates come that have had other districts say, well, we're not really certain about how that process works, and we're like, you know, we, we are well versed in it and we can walk you through the O one from the beginning all the way through to being certified. Dare I say any other question? <laughs> the need for subs is so great. Matt Stem, the executive director of IU thirteen, regularly takes vacation time and substitutes in the classrooms for IU thirteen and so do all the administrators at IU 13. When I was back in the day, last year even, on the sub list for ELCO, I would take a day. <laughs> First of all, ASAP would blow up. There were like 20 jobs if I wanted one. So I'd take one and I'd get to that school, and if I got lunch, I was lucky, because I went to this building, I went here, go up there, do that. It's, it ain't easy. So yeah, kudos to all of you for working. I'm not saying any more. Goodbye. <laughs> all right, but now I'll say something. I do agree with Susan. Um, I, I think maybe the question really, um, yeah, yes, uh, for us here is, is whether these, the substitutes are, are kind of like people that are just maybe plugging a hole versus somebody 
that like would be a practice squad member on an NFL team or something where you get like you're you're trying to develop people to to fill needs that you're going to have later you know every practice squad has a linebacker and a running back you know like you know physics you know people need physics right chemistry Okay. And I, I, I agree with all these things, but adding permanent, I'm just going to share this with you, adding permanent positions to the budget means that we probably will need to be at the full index this year. That's what that would mean. And in fact, we probably should have done a budget that would exceed the index back in January. I'm just, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that's what that means in terms of when you add personnel positions, it is, it is significant. So it's also something that you have to look at because that's the impact that that would have. We, could, we can certainly look at those and give an analysis of some of those numbers, but uh, it, would be, it would be significant. In addition to if we're looking at some of the other programs they want to implement, because this would be in addition to that in the future. These are positions that are in addition to that. Again, not opposed to it, just saying that the, the resources and how we, how we fund these things are things that we have to consider. And the other thing, you know, I, it's all good conversation, but, you know, if we want to add all day kindergarten, you know, are we going to have permanent subs or are we going to have kindergarten? You know, I think we have to talk. It's all good discussion, but I think we have to weigh our options, which is the best for the, the, the students and for the school district and things like that. And with your analysis about sports, a linebacker and a, and a running back, that linebacker and that running back that you're training and you're getting in good shape, still can leave you. So just because we make that sub permanent sub here doesn't mean they jump ship and go to Elko because it's a full-time teaching job there. I don't think teachers, my opinion, I don't think teachers get into this position to be long-term subs or be building right. subs. They want to be, be a teacher. teacher. So to, I think what we're doing is good with the, with the long-term subs and the building subs, but to make a, I changed my thought on some of this, that making a permanent building sub as a contracted employee might not be always the best option because they still can jump ship and leave us. So do we go through all that and, or do we just try to keep chugging along and hope that more students go to the teaching field rather than leaving the teaching field? And I hope they do. But I, that's just my thoughts on that. But it, I think this is all good discussion. But I think with the budget, as Phil's saying, I think we got to look at what we have and what our greater needs are going to be it would be great to have the win the billion dollar lottery that we could fund all this stuff, but I think we need to look at that. Yeah, well, so I guess I was looking at it maybe not as, as something that was definitively more expensive. Like for instance, um, <clears throat> like, I, like these positions maybe wouldn't even be permanent. Like for instance, our are these building subs motivated by $175 a day, or are they motivated by, hey, maybe we're going to help you develop into a, a tenured actual teacher here, like that? So I think we can look at what that rate is, and we've increased that, and we're going to continue to examine that. But if they become contracted positions, then they will be permanent if they're under the CPA. That's not something that I would have an option with. So because I have if, a we're offer, if we're going to offer them, that's just that's just a uh, a bargaining unit. That's that's just what it's going to be. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking of it in, in terms of what motivates what may motivate somebody to stay versus. Well, you know, it used going. to be that. So you had yeah. people that would be the substitutes, and then they would look at that and do that, and then come in and take a, a short term or a long term assignment, and then we would use those as the opportunity for those people to then. You're right. Be sort of like the you know the squad and line up, and we used to have a lot of that. You know, at one time in this district, this is just a, this is a cycle of the economy and the bigger issues. You know, we had people that were on child rearing or parenting leaves and other types of leaves. I can tell you that at one time in this district, we probably had two and a half dozen staff members that were on those leaves, unpaid leaves, unpaid leaves. And we had people that were in those and we never had any issues. I'm going back 20 years here. And that's just a very different time than what we're in right now. But I'm, I'm concerned that we have to be careful about what we do to try to address 
we can do some things, but these are some larger employment macroeconomic issues that we're facing like every other district. And I think we're, we're doing an effective job staying ahead of the curve, but I think we have to be very strategic about how we do this. That would be the one thought. But it is, it is a very significant, as personnel is, it's just uh, that's our, because that's what we do is we, we pay people to provide services. That is always going to be a school district's uh, most significant expense. It sounds like we're going from recruitment to retention. And I think one of the main ways that any school district can re retain teachers is through support from the supervisors, from the principals. Yeah. And I feel like we do that here. So I'm not like that part of it. How do you keep you know people from leaving? Well, if they have support from their principals with student behavior, typically, and the, and the climate of the school is positive. Um, you have teachers electing not to go somewhere else, if, even if it is more money, um, because that's the nature of teaching. So at, as far as that's concerned, like I, I couldn't be happier with that. That is a factor. But, that is a big one. But, but this, is a, this is a real issue that every school district right. is, is facing. I'm not diminishing this in any way. We're gonna, we will continue to look at solutions that, that come up and to the best of our ability to do that. But there are larger issues that we're dealing with here in terms of just the sheer lack of a number of people that are entering education and substitutes. You know, in some states, I'm gonna, I'm gonna digress here, so Dr. Bosman, I'll have to forgive you. you can, <laughs> but in some states, they actually have people that, are, that do not have a four-year degree are permitted to substitute within schools. Pennsylvania, does require that to substitute within schools. And that's where I have a question. So we're talking about bringing in these permanent subs and they're emergency certified. Can they become an actual tenured teacher? They cannot, correct? Are those certifications good for, are they permanent? They're, or is it? Yeah, so they're, uh, they're an emergency for the purposes of substituting. Could they eventually, if they had a subject area and then they took the certain emergency permit, they were hired for a job, they would have to go back and take credits while they are working for a period of years, and then they could obtain a permanent certification. And we have had that happen in some cases, but it is, it is not a, it's not an easy process. It's a, it's a process. Well, and that's what I was thinking, like we were talking about the shortage, and if, if they already have the credentials to become a permanent teacher, what is the, what is the percentage of people that are getting emergency certified that are coming on as subs versus actual teachers? Not that they're not teachers, but you know what I mean. It's, Graduated it's from high. college with a teaching degree. What would you say? I don't think the, the person that's graduating from college with a teaching certificate is going to get emergency certificate. No, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying, how many of the people that we're hiring have the emergency certification How versus many substitutes, substitutes are we hiring yeah, that are emergency certified, emergency certified, certified rather education. than a teacher? Yeah, yeah. Because Do you have a number of different percentage on that, Dr. Bosman? I mean, the only one I have a, a, a real solid number would be on our, at least just as a gauge for our building substitutes, because the other folks, most of those are certified. But with our building subs, I know that probably 75% are emergency certified and only 25%. I'm just trying to think about the folks we have right now. So it's, it's a small portion that actually have, a, you know, the, the credentials. Teaching degree. Yeah. Um, it's just the folks that are coming out of school, there's so few people and there's so many jobs, mm -hmm. they're not going to substitute because they don't have to. Right. And some, you have a portion of, of folks out there who are just content doing the day-to-day, -day, like Dave, tried when it was hard to get a job and they're just content doing the day-to-day -day and they're going to probably ride it out. We've reached out to these folks and it hasn't resulted in people saying, oh yeah, I'm interested. There's still a large portion who are just happy doing the day-to-day. Because -day. then you can say, no, I ain't going today. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. I'm with you, buddy. Go ahead. I'm with you, buddy. <laughs>
All right, we'll move on to policy and management. I think this. I think this is. I think this is easier. Yeah. So, so we have a couple things here about the uh, the policies for adoption. These are ones that we did talk about last month. These are our summer school staff, our employment contracts and agreements. This is where we are. Just combining some of our multiple employee policies into one policy just to simplify our overall uh, district policy manual. The two policies placed on the table, 202 and 254, the eligibility of non-resident students, which is a revision, and the educational opportunity for military children. This has to do with uh, there were changes whenever these laws were passed and when the policies were recommended from PSBA, they did not include language that reflected that students that are in military families, if they're moving around relocating an assignment, that they would be eligible to attend the schools in a particular area. So that's what these policies are reflecting of those changes. And that's what 254 is, is stating, essentially, that change. Any questions about that, or is that as simple as I noted there? That, that, is, a, that is a really simple one there, though. Yeah. Um, so pupil services and food service, uh, we do have two items here. The first item is our school doctor and dentist. Um, we use Yoakum Associates for our physicals. Um, so we'll ask for your approval on Yoakum Associates. And then also uh, Dr. Kayla Cliff is who we use for our dentist to provide services to our students. So we'll ask for approval for those. The uh, rates that are in board docs have not changed from last year to this coming year, or this year to next year. Just a quick item for the board. We will be hosting our extended school year services at South Lebanon Elementary School this year. You can see our dates will begin on July 8th and go through August 1. The students at the South Lebanon classes are all from Cornwall Lebanon classrooms. And this year we have had 47 students sign up. Uh, and we are planning on having seven classrooms with six elementary and one secondary. In addition, the IU will also be hosting an ESY program at Cedar Crest Middle School. And that's for students that attend to IU classrooms. Those are our pupil services and food service items. Any questions about those? Um, are we still in need of ESY teachers? Or have we staffed that? We're fully staffed in teachers. We are still looking for some paraprofessionals. Okay. Um, and, but uh, generally speaking, I actually even have more teachers than I interested than I need, so that's a good thing. Do, um, do and that was, that was just all of the teachers that are working ESY are current contracted teachers in the district. Do we have those on for approval for next week? No, not for next not, week. Okay, but we will have them on and they'll be... Correct. We'll have it all to do it in May is what you're thinking? Is yes. We'll finalize that. Okay. But, but we still have the names and the people who have expressed interest, so we're in good shape. Yeah, where we're at right now, um, it has been uh, last week they could tell me their interest. The students have until the end of February, and then we sent out a parent letter in March. The, parent le the parents indicate whether or not their child will be attending. That then drives to say, okay, how many classes do we need? So the interest uh, to the staff went out in an email last week, um, and then their responses were still looking like for some paraprofessionals, but their interests have been coming back to us. So that look for that in May. It's such a great program. And this is the first year in a long time Ray is 19, he's going to work, he's not going to ESY. We'll miss him. We'll miss him. We'll, we'll be here. Okay. Do we have any questions about those items? Okay, thank you. We have technology and transportation is our next item on here. And Dr. Murray, you're gonna talk about our software subscriptions.
Okay, so we have, uh, we try to be as transparent as possible when we do the uh, software. This is actually in preparation for the final proposed. We just want to make sure everybody is aware of what is actually in the budget when it comes to technology because we do use a lot of different software. And we have a, a very nice process that's put in place for this. So the first thing that we do is look at our instructional software. And we meet with Dr. Rackley and we make sure that all of the instructional software is being utilized for curriculum that has been written and also coincides with our comprehensive plan that we have for the district. Now, when we do this, we meet with a lot of the principals and we talk about usage. So we look at the usage, making sure that it's used in the, in the classroom, it's aligned to our curriculum, and it's a right fit for our district. So this is something that we do annually to make sure that everything fits where it's supposed to fit. And then we look at the operational software. This is operational software that we use to run the district, whether it's our student information system, our financial management system, run any of the hardware, anything along those lines. Um, for this particular year, uh, all of the major software that we use and subscriptions that we use are remaining the same. Um, one of the nice features that we have locally here is that uh, the Lancaster Lebanon Intermediate Unit is also the PA state software sales for every district in the state. And why that's really important to us, instead of all of these companies doing one-off contracts with every district that's going to utilize them, the IU actually negotiates the best price for us. And what helps with that is that gives us more purchasing power. So instead of a district of 5,000 students going out to purchase software, we're now an entity of several tens of thousands of students because it's all looped into one massive group. So we get the best price available. Uh, so that works out really nice. So the majority of the software that we purchase is through this purchasing, um, I, I don't want to say it, a lot of it does go out for bid and come back, but it's also a, a very large negotiation that happens to give us the best price possible. And when these contracts end, then the intermediate unit goes out and negotiates the best possible price. And when, they, when a company comes back and says, well, the whole PA state is so low, we have to keep you competitive with what we charge the other states, and they raise it, they say, no, we don't accept that. Um, they actually negotiated a very large contract for the majority of the state that almost every district used, and they just went back and forth, and they were able to negotiate some of the lowest prices I've seen in the U.S. Um, if you go out to find it. So I was really impressed with what they were able to do. Um, as we look at the particular software that's up here, some of the major items, we have added a lot of different Microsoft pieces from our previous contract. So in our previous contract, um, we didn't have, we switched from a new phone system. Our new phone system is now Microsoft Teams. So we're using that, so that helps us out. And we're also using a lot of the cybersecurity pieces in there. So endpoint response and endpoint management uh, really helps us with cloud vision. We were able to actually help out a lot of um, different situations by being able to pinpoint uh, usage, protect identities, protect our students, things of that nature with that. So in this particular budget year, Microsoft budget did go up a little bit but that's because we added services. Overall, um, there was some increase in the software. We're seeing this across the board. A lot of the larger companies are purchasing smaller companies and then raising the price. So we've been able to negotiate and keep things fairly stable, um, but there were some increases. Some of the, the larger items that we use, again, I mentioned Microsoft. But we also have Skyward in there. Skyward mm -hmm. is our student information system and our financial management system. So a lot of the controls that we use throughout the district for record keeping, anywhere from attendance to grade books to um, check history, um, human resources, all of that is all wrapped into one program to help us out. And that includes like food services and all kinds of things are all wrapped into that. Um, so this is the list that we have, we're presenting. Um, this will be in for the budget and for the uh, proposed final um, and you'll see the list in there as well. Any questions about the software we use?
Does turn it in plagiarism checker actually work? Yes. Wow. Um, we do. Yikes. And a lot of times, um, what we have that it's tied into our uh, learning management system. So the teachers have the option of actually having the students submit and turnitin.com checks for plagiarism. The nice thing about that, it also checks all the previous works that have been turned in. So if a sibling turned in a paper, another, early, like a younger sibling, can't turn in the same paper. <clears throat> so it prevents that. And it is very accurate. We do have a lot of teachers that come down and ask for support with that and say, can you interpret what this means? And we're like, yeah, 97% of that is plagiarized from this Google search right here. So it does pick it out. We have, unfortunately, talked to students about plagiarism. And, you know, and some of them have made poor choices. But it's a learning opportunity. Yeah. So, so yeah, we have I have a question. As yeah. we're dealing with AI, I mean, a lot of kids are putting in there, don't plagiarize, and it's writing them a paper. So how are we dealing with that? Because they can write a paper that would not be considered plagiarized, and that probably yeah. wouldn't pick up in this system. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, AI, we could have a 10-hour discussion tonight on AI. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's we, not. we can chat a little bit about <laughs> that. But what, I'm, I'm, what we are discussing is using it to a better method. Instead of preventing our students, allowing our students to understand the power and the ramifications of using it. And a perfect example of this is imagine when uh, the calculator first came out. And this is in the 80s. And this is the same thing when I talk to the teachers about AI is, you know, there were pickets in Washington about allowing students to use calculators. Think about when Google came out in 98. Um, oh my gosh, I don't have to go to an encyclopedia. I have it at my fingertips. So it's the same kind of idea. So we have to teach the students what's right and what's wrong. The nice thing about AI right now is it's still very formal. So you can pick this up. And I've actually had to sit down with uh, one of my family members about this was not you, and I can tell. Um, and so can everybody else. Um, so it, it is very... Um, it's very real. It's something that we're addressing. And actually, we had oh, six hours of professional development today, or professional learning, because today was a professional learning. So my crew was out. And I was able, after our one cabinet meeting, I was able to join in a three-hour work session. We're also showing teachers how to use, utilize this for all types of time-saving um, potential. So an example of this would be, um, one teacher would give out a, a web quest, an, an interactivity for the students to do, to engage them and to learn. But not every student is on the same level. So instead of writing this and spending hours to differentiate per student, AI can do this in a matter of minutes. So I showed them how you can take an assessment and differentiate this on four levels of student ability. Um, so that they're still learning the same content, still touching the same standards, but at the same time, differentiating for the students' needs. The other thing that we also addressed with AI was the new steals that we've been talking about. So we can actually go out there and say, I want a fifth grade um, lesson on the water cycle using steals. And it will give you an entire lesson, activities that they wouldn't have even thought about, and then it aligns everything to the new steel standards. So it's writing and helping them with activities. They know what they want. It's just going to take hours and hours to create all these activities. Whereas if we involve AI, it's really neat. Um, another thing that was kind of a waha for me was we had two science teachers at the middle school that had taken it. And they were looking for different activities. And one of the activities that they ran in class was the same type of one that popped up but there was a spin on it that they hadn't considered. So they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I never thought about this before. Now I'm going to use that spin in class. And it, it was really neat to hear them like, talk about this. And this was everything from your major cores to even your elective. Um, we, were, we were doing all different types of AI, and it was just amazing what was happening. So we are looking at talking to, to the students, saying this is available. Um, it is not perfect. It gives you ideas. It'll help with writer's block. But the nice thing is it also 
tells you specific AIs also give you references. Like, where does this come from? So now you're building your bibliography. So if you're going to write a report, don't rely on it. Help, this will help with writer's block, but then pull this information. And our teachers are also working on towards creating ideas and prompts that outsmart AI. And, the, and the, what I mean by that is they're asking for very personable, specific items to them. You know, give me a PowerPoint. Like, my, uh, someone in my family had to do a PowerPoint. <laughs> and on that PowerPoint, what they had to write Jason? an essay on, <laughs> on um, why did you choose those specific items. So you can't just say, all right, AI, why did I choose mountain biking? Why did I choose swimming? Why did I choose hiking? AI is not going to be able to do that. So now the teacher is able to check grammar, they're able to check all that stuff, but AI cannot produce an essay on those particular types. So we're, we're working on prompts like that. It's like um, a lot of people say, you know, make your assignment Google proof. Well, it's basically the same thing we're making AI proof. Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. So we're looking at it as a tool. Anyway. So. Yeah. Sorry, I know, I know, I'm sorry. I only know that because I have some siblings in college. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's good that we're teaching them because it it, it is going to be some way somehow in the future yeah. implemented in everything, and so it's good to teach kids how to use it to benefit them because they're going to need it for their job and everything. So yeah. yeah. Okay, that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw that, somebody says, hey, look at, look at what I got here with this chat, GP, G2P. I said, I said, well, I don't know. I said, but those are actually some pretty good questions that are this chat GP guy or whatever came up with, you know. That was a couple years ago, but, but it, is, it is pretty amazing even to see how that, how that works, yeah. So, yeah. So... <clears throat> The next items that we have on here under this are transportation contract approvals. And <clears throat> we have been very fortunate. We've had some longtime providers with our transportation who have been very reliable, uh, steadfast with us in the district for many years. And what we're looking to do is to consolidate this under uh, one of our transportation providers. That's Brightville Transportation Incorporated. Uh, they currently run our buses. And Bright Bill has a contract that expires in 2026. The reason that this is called a second addendum is because it was extended out a year during COVID. So it's, that's why there was an addendum just to extend it a year. So that's why it's called a second addendum. Uh, this addendum here would look at that contract and move that from 2026 to 2031. So that would be uh, the Brightville transportation for our buses. This would also then look at our vans and our type A contract for students with special needs. And that's special transportation needs is what that means. There can be a whole slew of different circumstances. We do have some students that just by virtue of where they live, perhaps a bus can't get to that particular area. We may have students that require uh, wheelchair assistance or just, just by geography and where they're going to. It needs a van or a smaller bus. A type A would be a, a micro bus, a smaller bus that could get to those particular areas. So in looking at the efficiencies of this, this is a recommendation that we would have. Uh, that contract would begin then in July 1 of 24, and then we would have some of these efficiencies in, in our cooperation working with Bright Bill. Questions about that, transportation? Those will be on for approval next week. And then we do have one van driver on for approval as well uh, next week that we will have on there. Are there any questions about any of the technology or transportation items? Are there any questions about any of the items that we have talked about tonight? Except maybe substitutes, but no, no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Any questions about any of the items? Okay. Are there any questions from anyone in attendance about any of the items that we have we have discussed this evening?
Okay. Mr. Schlegel, that concludes our presentation of items to the board. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Demensic, and thank you all for all the um, very thorough information that you provided to us. And also, thank you to everyone for the um, rich discussion and input. I think it's, it's very good when we can talk openly about these things and things that, you know, we could take a look at um, and just discuss. I think that's all really important, so thank you all. Uh, I will announce that we will have um, an executive session. Uh, we'll take a few minutes of, of a break, and then we'll come back and we'll um, have that for the purpose of a student matter. So at this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion and a second to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.